John Jeffries. Uh, I was born in Salt Lake City, Utah, August 7th, 1929, and uh, was raised by a mother uh, who was single mother and five children, so we had the bare essentials, barely, <laughs> as a young person. But I got a chance to work on my mother's brother's farms and sister's farms uh, as I was growing up, so uh, I had a great childhood, but uh, was educated right there in Salt Lake, went to uh, the elementary, high school, and the University of Utah, and wow. gra graduated as a teacher. And that was my desire, was to be a coach and a teacher. My mother would send me to the bakery for bread, but wouldn't provide me with any money. And uh, so I'd try and get the men that were working in the bakery to give me a loaf of bread. I did that quite often, and I'd try and get a little work there to so your connection get the bread for your family? Yes, because our my father was an alcoholic and uh, wasn't available. And so she was raising five of us on her own. Mm. And because she couldn't afford the liquor, she divorced him finally <laughs> so that she could take care of us mm -hmm. kids. But that depression was... Uh, as a young person, I thought everybody was in the same boat, you know. I didn't realize there were people having three meals a day, except when I went on the farms and they had food. Yeah. So I had a great childhood. The rest of my siblings, brothers and sisters, didn't have that advantage. For some reason, I loved working on the farms. When did you graduate of your high school? Uh, 46. I graduated when I was 16 and uh, worked uh, a year and then got a full ride scholarship as a track person for the University of Utah. Oh, tell me about your, you were in track team. Yeah. What? Uh, well, I went to the coach and said, uh, uh, can I get a scholarship? And he said, well, what do you run? <laughs> were you long marathoner or what? Splinter or what? A long distance. Long distance. Well, that's what he, I, I said, what do you need? He says, I need a miler or a two-miler. And I said, I, I'll do that. And he said, uh, well, report, and I'll time you, and if you go fast enough, I'll give you a scholarship. What is your record? Uh, the record was <laughs> the last conference uh, was in Denver, Colorado in 1951 at night. It was snowing in June, and the coach came up to me. I was running a uh, quarter miles then, and he said, if you run the two mile, uh, we can win this may race, but you've got to get a second, third close to get the points. Mm -hmm. So I ran the two mile and got a third. Uh -huh. And I hadn't run that for two years but I ran that night. So yeah. on, the, on the way home from the track meet in Denver to Salt Lake, I was a hero. That was my day in the sun. <laughs> but uh, graduating 51, went directly into the service. I enlisted. What was the scholarship? Uh, full ride. And I, for, but I went into education and so they paid all my tuition books and everything. Wow, that's very nice, huh? Yes, I wouldn't have been able to go to school. Nobody what had was, any money. What was your major? Uh, fine arts and public health. And uh, I was going to be a teacher of art, painting, and be a coach. So you graduated 1951 from Utah, University of Utah. So, right. But. Did you know anything about Korea, and did you? How did you know uh, the Korean War broke out? Well, I saw the uh, that the conflict was going on, and I was graduating, and uh, I was going to go on a mission for a church and spend two years as a missionary. But uh, uh, 
because of the war, they said, maybe that's not going to be possible. So I enlisted in the service to go help in Korea. They sent me for training to Fort Ord, California. And, uh, but I was sort of gung-ho. I was in good shape as a track person. And, uh, and so they put me in non-com school and were going to make me a sergeant. And then because I was doing so well, they sent me to officer's training school. And because I did good there too, they sent me to Fort Sam Houston to medical administration. And uh, from there, I was on my way to Korea. You were commissioned as an officer? Second lieutenant. Second lieutenant. When? This is about whew, the end of 52. Maybe in the middle, but at any rate. You enlisted army. Yes. Okay. Why? Well, my brother in World War II was ten years older, and he had high blood pressure and couldn't get in the service. Mm -hmm. And people scorned him because he didn't go to the fight. And so, my friends were running to Canada or getting married, so they wouldn't have to go to Korea. And I said no. We have a war, and I'm going to volunteer. That's very nice, huh? Well... Were you not afraid of? When you're 20-something, you're bulletproof. <laughs> <laughs> you know, not worried about anything. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so... Uh, and you were strong and healthy. Yeah. And so... Uh, and i never seen that much food before uh, in the Army. Mm -hmm. You go to the mess area, and there's all this food. <laughs> So I sprung from about 140 pounds to about 200, but all muscle. Mm -hmm. And uh, but now the service was very kind to me because they just kept training me. And uh, when they put me uh, on the transport to get me to Korea uh, and got to Pusan, <laughs> that's when. I realized there was a war on, <laughs> and uh, they assigned me immediately. When did you arrive in Busan? Uh, probably February or January. Fifty-three. Yeah, and uh, they assigned me to the Five Fourteen Medical Clearing Company in Quanju, Korea. Medical what? Clearing company. Clearing. Yeah, it was a clearing company. We had battalion aid stations by the fighting. Then clearing companies were back of that, and then hospitals were back of that. So but, what does medical clearing company do? Well, they assigned us to the PW Camp 5 in Quanju. PW Camp 5 in Quanju. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, so I had one platoon there. I had a little hospital. About that time, I had about 29 patients. I had one doctor, but I was a commanding officer. I replaced a major, but I was a second lieutenant. So I was under, I should have had more rank to be the commanding officer, but I was just a lieutenant, but they still, I was still in charge. Who were the patients in that? PWs, prisoners of war. North Koreans? North Koreans. Chinese? No Chinese in ours. We sent them to Kojido or somewhere else. But uh, I assisted in surgery with anesthetics. I even you, you, assisted. You didn't have any medical? Yes, training. I had one doctor. No, no, no medical. Just health you just ed. helped them? Yes, assisted. But... Uh, it was a great experience. We had a little, what we called the monkey house, which was a psych unit separate from our little hospital. And uh, so it was sort of a, but as I said, when I got there, we were having trouble with water, so I built a, a little four foot thing around our, our barracks. And when we had the breakout in June, uh, I was able to put my men behind that barrier, and so when the PWs came roaring by, 
they went around us because I had a wall and we had guns. And uh, so we survived that. I tried to call the, uh, the MP areas that were providing the guard service and protection and we couldn't get through, they'd cut the line. So we were a mile away from any helpers. What do you mean by they broke out the camp? The prisoners, yes. Please it, tell me about it, when and how. Well, what happened about 1.30 in the morning mm -hmm. on the 18th of June, uh, we heard the firing, we rolled out of our bunks and got our weapons and ran to see what was going on. Uh, the lights were on in the guard towers between the uh, uh, fences that held the prisoners on the other side of the fences. And what was happening is that was astounding was all of a sudden hundreds of the PWs ran to the fence, threw their towel into the fence, and on command pulled. And they snapped these poles that were like telephone poles, and that first fence went down in just seconds. Another group of Korean prisoners ran forward and threw their towels into the, because they were double fencing, and they threw their towels into the fence and give a yank, and those two fences that held those prisoners was down. Mm -hmm. And they poured out of there about 10,000 of them. In the 10,000 POW? Yes. Well, that's what they said. I only saw about a thousand or so coming out of the compound where we were. But uh, there were a lot of them. It looked like a bunch of ants, you know, I mean, just hundreds of them coming. So uh, that little dike I, <laughs> I had made to keep the water out water, yeah. saved our lives because they came to that. We were shooting. They went around us. And they were gone in a matter of a few minutes. So all gone? All 10. They said 10,000 broke out that night. And, and we woke up in the morning. A battalion finally got through to us and said, come and help us. We have a wounded. And I said, I'm not going anywhere. I'm trying to stay alive down here. They said, well, you're in better shape than we are. I didn't know what that meant. But uh, it was only way later the next day that... Uh, they would come down to see how we were doing. <laughs> so we survived it, but uh, it was quite an experience. Oh yeah, when they when he finally got through to him, they said, "Aren't you all dead?" <laughs> because they came across our right where we were. Yeah. And and so the guys that were supposed to protect us, uh, we were medics. <laughs> we all had weapons, but. We weren't trained to fight. I was because of my training, but the ones I had were uh, all medics, and medic, they were right? actually supporting the small the hospital, hospital yeah. which was dealing with no Korean POW. Yes, we took care of the battalion MPs as well, but most of our work was so you the didn't prisoners. patrol inside of the camp, compound, never, but medical, just medical. Yeah. Tell me about North Korean patients. How do they behave? How, what do they speak? How do they, you know, what? They appreciated us because oh. we were taken care of. And uh, what was very interesting is our psych ward, uh, while we were having all this excitement, the sergeant that was in charge of that psych ward, which was located away from us, came running in just in a pair of boots and his shorts, his underwear. <laughs> he says, Help, help, we're, we're, we're in trouble. And those prisoners, our patients in the psych unit are going to get away and come and help. And I said, no, we're taking care of our problems. So he ran back to the what we called the monkey house. And uh, he later reported that the prisoners took the fence down to get out of the psych ward. But they said thank you and put the fence back up before they left. Appendectomies, we did uh, all kinds of surgeries, hernia surgeries, we did battle wounds, and uh, just took care of all those prisoners, whatever was going on with them. If it's they needed the health care, oh yeah, well they're there with us. We provided food. Same food that you ate? Yes. Uh, 
after all that and everybody was gone, it wasn't too long be after that that uh, I got assigned to the 64th Field Hospital for the prisoner exchange in Panmunjong. And, uh, 64th Field Hospital. Field we, Hospital. And so we took all of our PWs that we had left <laughs> and put them, exchanged them for uh, the ones that were the South Korean soldiers and the American soldiers. Were there soldiers. any left to POW of North Koreans because you said yeah, they broke Yeah, well, well, I thought they'd all got away, but there were about 3,000 left. And so we had that exchange. But interestingly enough, when we were taking them up to Panmunjong, mm -hmm. to the, what I think we call it the Freedom Village, uh, we'd issued the prisoners all new uniform, you know, fatigues, new boots, new socks, everything, haircuts, everything, so that when they were going up in the trucks, they'd look very good coming mm -hmm. in. On the way up there, they took all the clothes off, threw them on the road, scratched each other, and so when they got up to the exchange point, they're saying, look what those guards did to us in the prison camp. Yeah. It was, and I've got pictures of that, where the road is strewn with boots and clothing. But uh, that shocked me, but uh, that they'd do that because we'd treat them pretty well. You said that you have a picture, but did you have a camera at the time? Yes. And you took it? Took pictures of all of that, and the prison break, and the fences that came down, and the dike. I was documenting my adventure. Wow. So what did you feel when they betrayed you? Well, first they said to us, after all this excitement, they said, the North Koreans have uh, declared uh, what that we were imperialist. Yeah, or imperialist, or we had broken. We they declared us as as uh, public enemies or something that yeah. we had we had misbehaved in taking care of them in the prison. But uh, that surprised us, and they weren't going to let us go up near the north because we were designated as criminals if you were associated with the prison or PW the prison war commands so uh, when I got an assignment the 64th field hospital to go up to the very 38th parallel uh -huh. I was a little concerned but uh, there was no problem but uh, no I had a uh, had opportunities I uh, Worked over in, uh, I'm trying to think of the school, in Kwanju, the medical school, when they went into the armistice phase. They had me over there to the medical school and I gave lectures. I also loaded up my ambulances and took them to Pop Sun Po to the beach, <laughs> to the medical students, so that we had a good time. Although we were fired on by, they said, were uh, North Koreans that were, you know, out there by themselves, they weren't organized. But uh, that Red Cross on our uh, ambulances seemed to be the target on occasion. So you were in the medical clearing camp and also 64th field hospital. Yeah, that was. How was the? Uh, how many doctors? How many nurses? And how about the medical supplies, equipment? Was it enough? Or did well, you? We had we had plenty in our PW assignment. When we got up to the 64th, we had everything. We had lots of nurses, lots of doctors. We had everything. We flew in a lot of people to take care of the prisoners that we're getting, that we were receiving. You mean the American? Uh, American the and the South Korean. There were all the nurses female? Most of them, yeah. They shipped them all up. We didn't have any females in our unit because we we're too close to the problems. But uh, 64th Field uh, Hospital sort of looked like MASH on TV <laughs> with, uh, yeah. with lots of help. But uh, 
Then, because I'd been a non-com, a, a lieutenant, or I mean a sergeant, and they had discharged me to become an officer, they let me go home for Christmas. What are you talking about? You said that you were the second lieutenant. Yes. And then sergeant? Well, no, I was a sergeant uh, before I went to become a lieutenant, right. before I went to officer's training. Right. But because I'd had that prior service, they counted that as two services. I see. And so then I was eligible to go home. For when Christmas. did you go home? Probably uh, Christmas Eve. Nineteen fifty-three. Yeah, late December. Um, what was the most difficult or painful moment during your service in Korea? Well, I uh, was look. This was when there was this armistice and. Uh, I came upon a drunk GI, an American sergeant, and he was shooting at the Korean children that were between the running back and forth in the village. And I confronted him, and I didn't have a gun, and he was going to shoot me. And uh, American sergeant? The sergeant was going to shoot me. No, why was he? In the beginning, tried to kill. He, kill he was the drunk. Kids. He was drunk, and he was having fun, shooting at the children. And I, well, yeah, I was going to take the gun away from him until he poked it in my face and said he was going to kill me. I ran back and got a gun and went looking for him. And several of the South Koreans helped me look for him. They wanted him to get shot too, but I couldn't find him. He was smart enough to get out of there. But uh, that was one of my horrible moments. When, uh, but luckily, I couldn't find any wounded kids. So he was a lousy shot being drunk. Was it happening often? No, that was just one occurrence, just out of the blue. Uh, but the Korean people, when I was in, uh, in Pusan going to my assignment to Kwanju, a Korean boy came up to me and said, uh, you need me. And I said, why? He says, because I can help you in Korea. And I said, okay. He said, let me see your orders. And then he saw Kwanju. He said, I'll meet you there. So Chong Sing Yong went from Pusan to Kwanju, and he stayed with me in my hospital the whole time I was there. He was an interpreter. He, had, he finally brought his family up. The picture I painted, that's his house. How old was he? He looked about 20, 19. 20 years old, OK. And uh, I didn't know he was married. And when, uh, and I didn't know he had a little boy. He had a little Scotia or something they called him. Is that small for yeah. Korean? No, no, that's Japanese. Scotia. Japanese. Scotia. Well, anyway, I called him Scotia. <laughs> but uh, one of the things I did, uh, his wife, Chong's wife. Chong Song Yong, you said? Chong Sing Yong. He, uh, his wife had an impacted tooth and was having a terrible time. So I went to, to that house and pulled that tooth for her. <laughs> so I was taking care of Chong so <laughs> and his family. So he approached you and he said that you need me. So you took him from Busan to Gwangju? No, I don't know how he got there. I went on the train with the troops. But he showed up in Kwanju, found me, and stayed with me. And because I didn't smoke, <laughs> uh, every week they gave me a carton of cigarettes. Uh, every, uh, every week they gave me a carton of cigarettes. I gave them to Chong Sing Yong, and he could get all the food and groceries and whatever else he needed. What kind of work did he do for you? Oh, he was worked with us, with the patients. and. So he was like a nurse, kind of nurse? No, he was just my assistant. He Your was, assistant? Oh, yeah. He helped me with the patients. He helped me with the troops. He helped me with the prisoners. He was there every day. So and you paid him? Yes, I paid him, but uh, he just took 
the cigarettes I could round up because he could trade those for everything. And uh, I didn't need the cigarettes. But uh, I was amazed to learn how smart they are. They had the fire yep. here and then underneath the house, the smoke, and then out this way. So they had uh, radiant Warm. heating. Warm floor. Heated Warm floor. floor. Smart people. And then we had the kimchi containers. I didn't put those on there because they weren't good smelling. When did you depart from Sungyeong? I mean, what happened? Did he go to the Panmunjom? No. No, he couldn't go. They, I don't know why, but uh, we kept correspondence and uh, I think he raised a family of six or eight up in Seoul. And I tried to, con I, when I went to Seoul, I tried to find him. Couldn't find him. What a story. So who drew that picture? Me. I painted it. And that's Jung Sung Young's house in Gwangju? Yes, well, it was out in the village area. This sort of was a picture of the compound. And uh, this is a, this compound one and two. And uh, this is our hospital. This is our barracks for the hospital. This is the psych ward, monkey house. What did, what is, what was the monkey house for? The psychiatric patients. Psychiatric. Mental problems. We, you know, they're a little off. I don't know, but uh, we had them separated from these patients. And this, these are the compounds that held these. This is where the prisoners ran and put their towels in this fence. Poof. Down came that fence. Another bunch of Koreans ran to the fence, threw their towels into the fence, boom, and they were gone. My experiences in Korea were very positive. Why? And then I'm, well, just I loved the people, and I got along well, and uh, I never had any problems. Uh, I took care of a lot of GIs that had problems, what kind? social problems, going to the wrong places at night. Uh, we took care of the injuries and, uh, and we did pick up about 29 wounded soldiers uh, after the break. And uh, so we were, but I had good people. My uh, medics weren't trained for the firing and shooting. And my sergeant that I depended on a lot, I looked for him. He was under my bed during all this excitement. My doctor was hiding as well, but most of us were out trying to keep ourselves alive during the prison break. How much were you paid at the time? Not very much. Hundred and... You were officer? Yes. Yeah. Lieutenant. Hundred? Fifty or seventy? A uh, hundred and seventy? I don't know. Not very much. What did you do with the money? My wife was pregnant. She you got the, she got all the money. Oh. But uh, because I had had the service, then I could go to school after I got out. So, so I, tell me about it. How? What was the impact of your service, and how army treat you after you returned? To well, uh, there was a GI Bill of Rights, yeah. and uh, when I got back, my uncle wanted me to help him with his business. Yeah. And I started helping him, but then I was successful. So he said, teach my son to take over. And I looked at my wife, said, maybe I'm going to be a school teacher after all. But I sort of liked medics. So uh, I applied at University of Berkeley to go to hospital administration school. And uh, they said, we can't take you till you have one year experience civilian hospital. So uh, I called up Salt Lake and the biggest hospital in the state of Utah and said, can I come and train for one year? They said, yes. And 
they paid me $50 a month. Mm. I had a wife and a child, but I spent one year. And then the best school in the United States for hospital administration was Minnesota, University of Minnesota. And they only took 12, or 12 students a year, and they took me. Be one of those so stuff. you didn't go to the UC Berkeley to do it, but you no, were... I was going to Berkeley, but Minnesota right. was the best school. Best school. He, the guy that was running Minnesota, said, "I'm not letting you go to Berkeley. You work for me in Minnesota." So you used the GI Bill to get into the University of Minnesota, right? And they yeah. paid my way. Mm -hmm. How much did they pay? Well, they didn't pay. They paid for my schooling, but I had a job. Oh, my wife taught school. We both had taught, and so she was teaching school. And that's how we got by the one year at Minneapolis, Minnesota. Mm -hmm. But then when I got assigned to a hospital in Kansas, they started me at $175 a month with a master's degree in hospital ad. Under what? $175 a it's month. It's not better than what you were. Not much. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, uh, because I did pretty good, he gave me a raise to 275. I think he or doubled my salary. And then when I was finishing that, I had job offers from six different hospitals. Where do you want to go? And so I did children's hospital management of my career in Where? Salt Lake City, St. Petersburg, Florida, Columbus, Ohio, Buffalo, New York. And that's a Lucky John story. <laughs> so you think that the, the, you enlist to the Army and working in as a medical clearinghouse or the field hospital get you to this successful life? Terrific, yes. You do? Yes, no question. That leadership training and uh, the military is a discipline and it teaches you things and how to make decisions and uh, how to survive. Mm. And that, I survived. <laughs> but I never had to look for a job. That's the important message when I went from one job in Salt Lake to St. Petersburg, they didn't want me to leave Salt Lake. St. Petersburg said, we'll double whatever they offer you. So all of a sudden I was making money. Have you been back to Korea? Two years ago, that would be 2012 in May. Did you and go with him? Yes. What, what, tell me about the before and after picture. Well, I didn't recognize Korea. I didn't see any of these Kwanju or uh, houses that Chong Sing Yong lived in, except that she took me to the museum or the park to say, yeah, there's still, we have examples of that era. But uh, the people were very courteous. I had several people on the street walk up and say, thank you. And they just assumed I was military or ex-military. Uh, because we weren't, we didn't have any signs on us or anything. But I was impressed with the cleanliness of the streets, and every, everybody looked rub tubbed and scrubbed and nice people, and they spoiled us rotten. <laughs> they gave us a fancy place to stay and all the food you could eat for, for a week, and uh, we traveled right up to the. Where I was stationed uh, at Panmunjom, Panmunjom, and uh, I recognized some of the territory. But uh, no, it was a wonderful experience. What is the legacy of Korean War and Korean War veterans? Well, I think it. Uh, I'd been trained for leadership, but I think to be able to exercise it under some stressful conditions. Uh, I think it makes a, a different kind of person out of you. 
and I give credit for the military and my experiences. And then to have the Korean people come back and say, we'd like to say thank you, just knocked me out. It was, just, it was a wonderful, in the history of helping people, you rarely have somebody come back and say thank you very much. And that's the way it came across to me. And I was glad to have the opportunity to get back there, but that wasn't the Korea I was in 60 years ago. But my grandsons have all taken uh, the Korean martial arts. All three of them are black belts, one in New York and two in Salt Lake. All got to the highest level in martial arts as kids. I've just been very fortunate my whole life. And, but I think the experiences along the way, I got a lot of breaks, a lot of circumstances that just furthered my, uh, I don't know, I've had good health. I ran a, three marathons. I took fifth in the marathon. And uh, I'm going to be 85 in a few days. <laughs> you still look very young. You took care of North Korean patients. If you were given a chance to talk with the North Koreans, what would you say to them? I'd say I got along really well with them. They didn't, they weren't adversary at all with the medical side of it, that unit. Uh, I never had a hard time from them. Uh, I think they just appreciated the care and the keeping that uh, was being provided for them. I didn't see uh, anger or that. I saw every once in a while, one of them would try to get out, but they had guard towers, and by the time they got over that first fence, they were told to get out of there, get out of there, and they just sacrificed themselves a couple of times, right in front of us. Mm. You know, we were all telling them, go back, go back. But they killed themselves? No, the towers, towers. when they were getting away. Because they didn't listen. They wouldn't go back. Mm -hmm. They just they hadn't had enough of being a prisoner, I guess. Do you know what's going on in North Korea right now? It's what I read in the papers. It, it's sort of a sad, sad story. But uh, I think they have poor leadership. And I think the contrast between South Korea and North Korea is a lesson for the world. Any, any message to the young generations about the lessons of the war? Uh, well, I can tell you a story. Uh, one of my doctor friends that I kept acquainted with, a Korean, had me take a Korean boy at 18 years old and sponsor him to Salt Lake. His name was Sam Wee. And Sam Wee, I put him to work in the hospital in the evening, uh, in the financial. He was 18, had no English or limited. Uh, he went to school at night at the university. I paid for that. I paid his medical food, everything, sponsored him and uh, trained him. And I ran into him when I got back. Uh, the Salt Lake area, and I ran into him at the country club. And I said, Sam Wee, what are you doing? <laughs> I was surprised because we didn't have too many uh, non-Caucasian types in the Alpine Country Club. And Sam said, I'm a new member of your club. Oh, oh. But he said, I'm also a millionaire. I said, Sam? And he said, yes, I owe you plenty. I said, what? What has happened? He said, well, I got a young woman to come from Korea. We married. I got an apartment, and uh, I developed a little store at the bottom of the apartment, sold Asian food. And I trained my children there to work. And one of them's in Princeton, one's in Yale, and one is in Harvard. 
all three of my children are in top schools, straight A students. He said, that's what you did for me. I owe you. Had two Korean friends with him. But that's the story of Sam Wee. Mm -hmm. Couldn't speak English, didn't have an education, but he went to work. It's a good story. Yeah. And, uh, but I had several people. I worked in China for since then and uh, for a couple of years helping them with their children's hospitals and uh, I should have sponsored a few more people because they are eager to for opportunity. But Sam Wee is my favorite story. When did you begin to sponsor him? Probably uh, 57, maybe 50. Uh, and then I ran into him about 84. So he had time to get married and have some kids. Mm -hmm. So we got to give him about 30 years. Thank you so much for your interview and willingness to talk to me. And well, I will let you know about this interview.